Tell us a little bit about how this sort of deeply embedded coverture ethos, uh, the spirit of coverture begins to disintegrate because even though I know we see remnants of it now that you can talk about, it surely doesn't have the same hold on, on the imagination at least and on most of the legal structure than it did. Is it, does it unravel in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s? Are we looking at the Supreme Court here? What's the mechanism? Like most revolutions, it has to work in quieter, less visible ways over time before it explodes. And I would say that one piece of that change is just as there is a struggle for women to serve on juries, there also has to be a struggle for women to serve uh, in state legislatures mm -hmm. and on state courts. And there, out of those struggles come articulate women who can see what the infirmities that women are still living with are. You see a lot of this in people who are doing labor law and understanding the, that laws that are supposed to protect women in the 20th century are not protecting them. Um, they're protecting them out of all they own, as the line in Rodgers and Hammerstein Sanko. has them. And those lacks are more and more visible and harsh. Um, so the law that's supposed to protect women against harsh work protects them against night work if it's in pharmacies where it's easy work, but doesn't protect them against being hat check girls in nightclubs where they're exposed to sexual predators and so forth. They, lots of people are understanding and uh, seeing that pieces of coverture of that the culture of coverture need to be changed. And they are in place for uh, the experience of World War II. When the, the nation understands that it needs women in roles that had previously been closed to them. So even though it will recruit women for the military, holds them to 2%, but we've got a lot of women who have been in the wax or the waves or the women marines and understand what they got to do and what they couldn't do, the walls they came up against. It's also true for all the women who work in the war factories and the war plants, who learn to weld iron and then discover at the end of the war when they have a marketable, a very marketable skill, uh, and they're out to go out and be self-supporting. They're told, no, 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 uh, you're a girl. And those jobs are for men. Whether or not the men were veterans, whether or not the men served in war, whether or not the men served combat, all men are treated as though they were in combat and deserving, and all women are treated as though they uh, were there for pin money and for they should, should return and to the home return and have babies. And, <laughs> and return to the home and have babies, but not about how those babies were to be supported. Right. There are articles in Life magazine that say, um, why are women taking up seats in colleges that should be held by men? Well, you can read those two ways. It means one thing is they're being pushed out of colleges and made into unhospitable places. On the other hand, it means they were coming yeah, into, into colleges. colleges. And there's lots of women who uh, marry men who go to school under the GI Bill, and the women find their way into colleges. Remember in those days, public institutions, public colleges and universities charged virtually nothing for tuition. And it wasn't hard for many young women to enter college at, at that time. Then as the tuitions go up, then it becomes then it much becomes harder. harder. So we're getting a restiveness and a new set of experiences. And, and then by the 1970s. And then it comes together. It comes together. It comes together 
in two moments in the Supreme Court that if I taught nothing else, I want people to know. One is that it is not until, remember the 14th Amendment, which says everyone's entitled to equal protection of laws, is 1868. But it is not until 1971 that the U.S. Supreme, so a full hundred years later, that the U.S. Supreme Court rules in a case involving uh, whether a woman can be, a wife can be the executor of her child's estate, and the child's estate is $200 and the cornet that he played in the marching band, um, that the Supreme Court rules that denial of equal protection on the basis of sex might be, in certain narrow circumstances, a denial of equal protection of laws. That case was happened in Idaho uh, when the child of a divorced couple who was living with a father uh, committed suicide with one of the father's guns. And his mother, Sally Reed, thought it was absolutely inappropriate for that father to be the executor of her son's estate. It was argued by Alan Durr, a local lawyer, who had learned to see sex discrimination when he had been um, a member of his fr college fraternity and had gone around persuading other chapters to drop race discrimination. And he could see sex discrimination. This is a little case in Idaho, in New York, in the headquarters of the American Civil Liberties Union. Mel Wolf and the very young Ruth Bader Ginsburg look at that announcement in some legal paper and write to Alan Durr and say, would you like some help? And Ruth Bader Ginsburg writes a brilliant brief in support of Sally Reed. And that goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, Alan Durr argues it uh, and they win. And two years later, in a much more wide ranging case, uh, Sharon Frontiero is an Air Force captain and in the Air Force, you get depend men get dependence allowances for their wives and children for housing and so forth automatically but a woman officer does not get dependence allowances unless she can show that she provides more than half of her husband's support Sharon Frontiero says this is unfair this case works its way all the way to the Supreme they're a young couple there's a photograph of her she's wearing granny glasses and long hair uh, this case goes to the Supreme Court and Ruth Bader Ginsburg argues it. And when I taught this case, I play the oral, the recording of the oral argument. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is eloquent and you know how um, the Supreme Court's practice is to keep asking questions and not let any lawyer get further than a sentence or two before they come flashing in with questions. Not in front here not in front here, Ruth Baker Ginsburg gets to lay out her case for something like 10 minutes by the clock. Mm. And in the end of that, um, there is a magnificent majority opinion, uh, which basically says women have not gotten equal protection of the laws. Uh, women have been burdened by unequal protection for a long time. And then there are a couple of justices who says, this is 1973, and they say, well, all very well and good, but we're waiting for the outcome of the Equal Rights Amendment. We're waiting to be instructed by the, uh, by the Equal Rights Amendment, and if it is passed, then we would know what to do. Uh, without the Equal Rights Amendment, we will not hold discrimination on the basis of sex to as high a standard as we hold for discrimination on the basis of race. And then in the course of the next few years in the 1970s, Ruth Ginsburg will argue another series of cases. One of them is Taylor versus Louisiana, which challenges the practices of keeping women off juries and says you cannot throw women off juries for no cause. Right. Juries have to be drawn from a full segment of the population. Um, and she argues, which is one of, I, I know, one of her favorite cases, it's certainly one of mine, uh, Weinberger versus Weisenfeld, 
the social security statutes had been written to make it automatic that widows got widows benefits uh, because the vision was that they would be left alone in the world with children to raise. And Mr. Weisenfeld's wife dies when the infant is very young and um, he, need, he wants to cut back on his work so he can be a full father to his baby and he wants widowers support, widowers pensions and the Social Security Administration says it's not in the law, it's not in the law. And Ruth Ginsburg argues that case before the Supreme Court, she says it's not fair and in that context, after a political grassroots movement has raised the question over and over again throughout the country uh, of what is equal parenting, what is equal protection, it's a unanimous decision and many years later Justice Ginsburg will marry that, uh, preside over the marriage of that infant. That's a wonderful story and it does remind us that it is a combination of the sort of social circumstances and the legal transformation that in the end have undermined coverture.